Hey everyone, welcome to episode 7 of the Laser Cutter Build Series. Today we're going to get cracking on the external frame and cladding, so let's just dive straight in. I'm going to build the external frame for the laser cutter in mostly the same way as I built the inner frame. However, because it doesn't play a role in the mechanical functioning of the machine and really only needs to support itself, we don't have to get bogged down on exact tolerances and an over the top structure. So the majority of the framework will be done with 2020 aluminium extrusion. I've set up the cut list so that I can do gang cuts where possible. That means fewer measurements and cuts to make, which in turn improves speed and accuracy. I know many aluminium suppliers will cut to size, so if you don't have a good way of cutting at home, I definitely recommend that rather than trying to struggle through with a hacksaw or something. Trust me, I've been there. The blade on my chop saw is just a fine tooth wood blade, and that's perfectly adequate for cutting aluminium if you take it easy. Most of the structure is fastened using corner brackets, though I am going to do a few bolted through fixed joints where necessary, and I'll show you those in a bit. I know the corner brackets look a little fiddly to use and they are, but the benefit here for me is especially while I'm prototyping, it allows me some wiggle room to get the positions correct, so if I mess up the placement of a cross piece or something, I can just loosen off the nuts and slide it across instead of having to drill out for a whole new connection. Now with the first end piece assembled, I can clamp that roughly in place and slide my other sections into it. And just like that, we get our external frame roughed out. Now onto those bolted connections I talked about before. I'm going to be using them in the lid for reinforcement here and on the front lower section because I want to keep these corners clear to allow for sliding front panels. The sliding panel should give easy access inside the machine without the need for awkward hinge doors and extra hardware. They can also just be popped in and out should you need even more access for things like cleaning. So let me show you how the connections work with some offcuts first. So we have the two pieces we want to join at right angles and a button head M6 screw. We need to put a thread into one of the ends using an M6 tap. One of the differences between V-slot and T-slot aluminium extrusion is that V-slot has an M5 sized hole on the end here while a T-slot has an M6 sized hole. So just something to watch out for. On the other piece we need to mark the position of the join. Then we can drill through the extrusion making a large enough hole for a hex key to fit through. With the screw loosely threaded in, the other piece can be slid on and aligned with the hole, and then tightened down to make a secure rigid joint. A little bit of Loctite on that thread as well, and it won't be going anywhere. Now we can apply that process to the frame. I'm drilling with my parts clamped together so that I get identical hole placement. Incidentally, if you don't have a drill press, allow me to recommend getting one. This is one of the very first benchtop tools I ever bought, and even though it was the cheapest model available, it's really proved invaluable for doing things like this where getting a straight hole is kind of important. So this connection was also repeated in the lid frame for a bit of extra strength. 
My drill press couldn't go all the way through, so I'll finish off those holes by hand. With that done, it's time to add the acrylic windows to the lid. I'm using 3mm dark tinted acrylic. This isn't any special laser blocking formulation or anything, it's just regular cast acrylic. From all the research that I've done, I understand that light waves of the laser are sufficiently absorbed and blocked by the acrylic. If this wasn't the case, clear acrylic would be almost impossible to cut with a CO2 laser, which it most definitely isn't. I chose a dark tinted over just a plain clear because I thought it might help with blocking the bright flare ups in the visible light spectrum that you sometimes get when cutting. Plus, I think it looks cooler. Because it is see through, marking the positions of the screw holes actually couldn't be easier. Once I worked out a nice even spacing, I could mark with a sharpie on the protective film that's on the acrylic and then just drill them all out. I can then slide the nuts into the correct position by using the marks left behind by the drill as a guide. For the front face, you want to lean it up in a precarious manner while you adjust the camera angle. The, uh, the front piece goes on the same way as the top lid, just with the addition of a couple of handles. Now here's the thing, the hinges for the lid sit on top of the 3mm acrylic. So before I can attach the lid back to the frame, I need to make some 3mm risers for the frame for the hinges to sit on so that they sit level. If only I had some way to cut 3mm acrylic risers. While I'm hesitant to start lasering without proper extraction and safety setup, it will be the nicest option. But before we can start cutting things out willy nilly, I need to do something I probably should have included in the last video, and that's getting the laser beam's functional focal length. Basically the lens in the nozzle has a point at which it will do its best work, and that's the focal point. And we need to find that so we know what height to place our material below the nozzle. In theory we could somehow measure from the lens and down and out since I know I have a 2 inch lens installed, but in practice the easiest way I've found is just to do some real world tests. So I'll place a piece of MDF in the machine on an angle and run a cut across it and just see where it's the most in focus. Actually before I go on let me just show you how the Z axis is moving the bed up and down at the moment. I'm still going to install a powered z-axis but I wanted to show you a much less expensive and simple option which is just moving the belt by hand. I have a little pulley in there acting as a tensioner and it's, it's very easy to tighten up and by using my hand I can get very precise movement and control of the bed height. I know that may seem a little crude but simple can be good. Anyway back to the focusing. So it looks like the best part of the cut was on the left. I'll just adjust the position so that I can narrow down on that a bit further. Now you can hopefully see the best area is in the middle here. So what I can do is measure the distance from a fixed point on the laser head to get the relative focal distance. Now that I have my focal distance, I can make a quick little stepped gauge tool to find that distance between the tip of the nozzle and the material, which will make life a little easier. So it looks like my material needs to be positioned about 5.5mm away from the end of the nozzle to be in correct focus. We can make a more official gauge later, but that'll do for now because I want to finally cut those riser plates for the hinges. I won't go into the details of setting up the cut files and things in this video, but it is a good subject to touch on if people are interested. I'm sorry that the first two things we cut on the new laser were kind of boring, but that's just the way it goes sometimes. 
this lid actually got quite heavy once the acrylic was added on and I think in hindsight two millimeter acrylic would have been okay instead of the three millimeter but it's not a deal breaker for me and yes we will be adding gas struts once they arrive Okay, so like the other panels, I had the front sliding panels pre-cut by the supplier. To create the sliding function in the T-slot, I had to put a four millimeter riser strip in the bottom groove. Uh, this was just a little strip of wood and it's so the panels can pop in the top and then rest down into the bottom slot properly without just falling out. Now the slot width on T-slot is just over six millimeters. So two three millimeter thick panels slide nicely past one another. That's all the see-through stuff done, so let's get on to the aluminium cladding. I bought this as a whole 900 by 2400 sheet from the supplier because it's fairly inexpensive and I wanted the offcuts to play with. It did make for an uncomfortable drive home in my little hatchback though. This is just 0.7 millimeters thick, which makes it very manageable to cut without specialist tools. Again, I'm just using a fine tooth wood blade and my circular saw to cut down the panels. I didn't need to go with thicker aluminium because we've already got a self-supporting external structure with the T-slot extrusion. All we're really doing is adding a light skin to stop smoke and light escaping. Here's a little tip for cutting aluminium and actually it's the same when cutting acrylic. You want to set your blade height so it's only just passing through the material. This gives a much shallower angle of entry for the blade's teeth and will give you a better less jagged cut. Marking the screw hole positions is a little trickier now that I can't see through it but I'll eyeball where the panel sits in relation to the slots on the T-slot and mark that up. It's always a good idea to center punch aluminium so that the drill bit doesn't wander off. And if you thought everything was going just a little too smoothly, well, it was at this point I discovered a little issue with the screws that I'd chosen to attach the aluminium to the frame. While they were the right length, they have a little taper to the shank, which was stopping the nuts from tightening down all the way on such thin material. I couldn't go get different screws because it was a Saturday and the shops were already shut, so I used a die to add a couple more threads to each screw, which sorted the problem out. Then I could attach the panels using a combination of slide and rotating nuts. Doing it this way makes it easy for me to take the panels on and off in the future for doing things like maintenance and having access for material pass through. The first three panels were easy because they don't have any major components passing through them, but the rear panel needs to fit the extraction system as well. So the idea is I'm going to have three gated outlets on the back. This is going to let me control where the extraction is strongest by opening and closing the gates. So if I'm doing something small, I can just have one gate open and maximum extraction in that area. The plan is to mount each gate to a T-slot upright so that it's got something solid to fix to rather than just trying to mount it straight to the aluminium. I position them roughly in the middle of each third and at a height where they should be able to pull air from both above and below the material the majority of the time. I also added in another upright towards the left side for the third gate to hang off. To connect them all up I had a talk with my mate who's a plumber and he was able to sort me out with getting some appropriate fittings locally. So I've got a 90 degree elbow, two T's and three flexible rubber couplings. They use a piece of straight pipe to connect the fittings so I can awkwardly measure up for those. Rather than trying to mark a straight line right around a piece of pipe I find it easier just to wrap a bit of tape around it. They pressed together pretty snugly, so I'm not worried about gluing them up at this stage. I was a little worried about the weight hanging off the back. They're okay, but I probably will add a brace in below in the future. With the extraction pipe work done, ooh, can we call it a manifold? With the extraction manifold done and in position, we can get back to fitting up the rear panel. I'm measuring up where the gates need to pass through the panel. Rather than trying to measure everything separately and hope it all comes together correctly, I like to, when I can, measure and mark things in place. So I'm going to attach the rear panel and mark the position of the uprights. And then transfer the measurements for the cutouts. To cut them out, I'm going to use a metal blade on the jigsaw, so I'm just going to put holes into each corner and then cut between them. 
While I'm at it, I may as well do the cutout for the extension box too, which is something we'll talk more about in the future. And after a quick file around all the edges, the panel's ready to go back on. To mark the gates back onto the T-slot uprights, I need to mark 10 millimeters in from the edge. I can then line the holes up on the gate with that and mark their centers. I'm using these spring-loaded nuts in the T-slot which will hold their position. If you do end up dropping one, a magnet makes pretty short work of getting it back up into place. For the side of the gates that aren't mounted to the uprights, they can just be bolted to the aluminium panels so that there's a decent air seal around the hole. And with that, the rear panel is sorted. Now the last one left is the top panel, which needs some cutouts for the electronics. This panel was a little short just because how the sizing of the sheets worked out to be, but it's not gonna matter once the electronics are mounted. So I'm gonna put the controller interface and the ammeter and water thermometer up here, which are the three main instruments I use when operating the laser. The other switches and whatnot will be mounted to the electronics enclosure when we get to that. I'll mark their rough positions using a sharpie before drawing up the lines a bit more precisely. The ammeter will be the trickiest, so I'm gonna start with that. I need to put a off-center two inch hole in the panel for it to fit, and I'll do that with a hole saw. Then I need to add a couple of holes for the screw posts. The cutout for the thermometer is simpler, but it needs to be pretty accurate because it doesn't have much of a flange around the housing. I'm putting down some masking tape to help protect the surface against scratches. I want to get it close with the jigsaw and then file out the last little bit so that I can get the edges nice. The last piece for the controller interface is just a couple of simple cuts. So that's the external frame and cladding done. And I have to say, I am very happy with how this is looking. And I think now that the machine is almost done, now is a good time for me to go away, get all my documentation together. So for next time, I can finally release the parts list, the 3D model and the build guide for this machine and the smaller version. Now, obviously we haven't finished everything. We've still got a bunch of little jobs to do but we're gonna tackle that in the next episode. So in the meantime, you can find me on Instagram or spin me a yarn down in the comments, but I will see you on the next one.